Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Vancouver. Welcome to a beautiful winter morning. I hope some of you or many of you were here and do enjoy yesterday. We are lucky to have you as global leaders for the sustainable seafood movement here gathered in Vancouver on traditional territory of the Coast Salish First Nations. And I understand this is the first time that the International Seafood Summit has been held in Canada. I think you chose Vancouver for good reasons. I'd like to think it's, uh, it's related to the work that's been done here uh, to make a seafood more sustainable. There has been undoubtedly a positive and measurable shift around the world uh, from the work that you have been done, working together and making real progress to build awareness and to save our declining fisheries and create a more sustainable marketplace for seafood. I want to thank uh, all the people who have made this possible, SeaWeb and Seafood Choices Alliance, the sponsors, uh, all of you coming from afar to be part of this and the work that you do around the world to take care of our oceans. There is uh, such an importance to the work that is taking place here. Turning the corner and starting to restore our oceans is pr um, probably the most important work that we can do in this generation, given what we face right now on this planet. I thank you for your work. I wish you well, really productive, uh, and inspiring time here in Vancouver. Thank you very much. Sustainability of the Highliner has been important for quite some time. But in the last six months, uh, we have made a couple of public pronouncements, which, of course, have attracted a lot of attention. Uh, we have committed to only buy from certified sustainable sources by the end of 2013, and, of course, uh, the sponsorship of, of this summit. Uh, many people have asked me, uh, why do you have this commitment? Uh, what motivates you? And I'd like to share some of that motivation with you at this time. Uh, first and foremost, uh, sustainability is good business. Uh, Highliner is a customer-driven organization. Uh, and when something's important to our customers, it's important to us. And sustainability is increasingly important to our large customers in North America. Furthermore, when we save money on energy, we reduce our carbon footprint, as others would say. Our expenses go down. When we uh, use packaging more efficiently, our expenses go down. So sustainability is good business in the short term. Uh, moreover, uh, Highliner has been in business for 112 years. That, that's a long time for any organization uh, to survive and prosper. And of course, if we're going to be in business decades from now, we need something to sell. So we have a great interest sustainable seafood now uh, and in the future. Uh, it, it's very important that we learn from our successes. Uh, a lot has been accomplished over the past two years in terms of sustainable seafood, uh, and I will come to that uh, in, in my thank you. But we need to remember that at the same time as a lot has been accomplished, there have been segments of the industry uh, that have been demonized. Uh, bottom trawling, uh, salmon aquaculture, and I'm not standing in front of you to say that, that, that all bottom trawling is good or all salmon aquaculture is good. But what I am telling you is that by demonizing them, uh, they will not improve. Uh, you, you will create fear. They will become defensive. But if you engage with those segments of the industry and you create market forces, as have been done by other parts of the sustainability industry, uh, sustainable movement, uh, you will see positive change. And, and I really implore you to do that going forward and, and, and learn from the successes that this movement has created. Prior to two or three years ago, uh, one of the big topics of strategic planning is where will our fish come from in the future? We, we, we looked you know, every year at declining resources around the world. Uh, we, we, our answer was agriculture. Uh, but we really had no hope that we would see an increase in the wild fishery. Yet, with uh, the efforts of many people in the room on the NGO side, the impacts they have on large customers, the impacts the large customers have on companies like Highliner and our competitors, uh, we've started to see real positive change in many parts of the world. So now in 2011, what do we see? We, we, we see dramatically increasing cod resources in the eastern Baltic Sea a very complicated fishery with many countries participating that was given up for, for dead five years ago. We see uh, little or no illegal fishery uh, for cod and haddock in the Barents Sea, north of Norway and Russia, and, and record high resources uh, increasing quotas. Uh, 
Uh, we see an improved uh, resource for Hokie in New Zealand. Uh, we see an improved and increasing resource for Aspen Pollock and Alaska. Uh, not all the problems are solved. There wouldn't be 700 people here in Vancouver today. But there is good news out there, and people need to be reminded of our successes. And let's not be like those generals who are always accused of fighting the last war. Uh, let's, let's learn from our successes and build a more sustainable future for ourselves going forward. Thank you. Well, first of all, I hate that word sustainable. It's like gourmet or adventure. You know, two words that are completely overused and mean nothing anymore. With seven billion of us on this planet, finite planet, I don't believe there is any human economic activity that is truly sustainable. You have to qualify that word sustainable with less or more in front of it. Your average 100% cotton pants or shirt or whatever is only 73% cotton. All the rest are chemicals put on to control shrinkage and wrinkle. And I had no idea. I just ordered fabric from a fabric supplier and sent it to a sewing factory and, you know, going about doing my business without any self-reflection. So we started an environmental assessment program that asked uh, a lot of questions. And in fact, I kind of learned from Toyota, which when they have a business problem, they say, ask the five questions. In other words, ask enough questions that you get past the symptoms and you get to the real causes of the problem. Anyway, asking all these questions in business is a real pain in the butt, let me tell you. But, you know, education gives you choices. And basically my company exists to make those choices. Um, I'd say my company exists to put into practice all the, all the things that uh, the smart people of the world say that we have to do in order to save this planet. Well, in my business, although we strive to cause the least amount of harm, we are still net polluters. We use non-renewable resources, and we cause waste. And in fact, we probably cause more waste than the final product. So we believe in, uh, in doing our penance. We, we take 1% of our sales, not profits, so whether we're profitable or not that year, 1% of our sales, and we've given away to environmental causes and to the people who are on the front lines that are really doing the good work. So in other words, we're supporting civil democracy. And I believe civil democracy is the strongest force anywhere in the world, stronger than any governments. In fact, look what's happening in Egypt and Lebanon right now. All the gains we made as a society are made through civil democracy. Just pick up the newspaper and you'll see that every day. I'd say that we can't save the planet by ourselves. So we try to influence other companies to do the right thing. And we try to lead by example. I've given you a little snapshot of what we're trying to do at Patagonia. And it may sound like we have all the answers, but we don't have all the answers. It's just that we've been asking the questions for a lot longer than most. Thanks for having me here. These summits have been going on for, for many years. Um, I missed the first one, um, which I regret. I heard it was a very small group of NGOs talking to each other. Um, but I've been at every one since, uh, and they've grown dramatically. The quality of participation, the extent of participation, the quality of the debate has moved on considerably. And that reflects the movement, the, the, the advance of the entire movement, really, of the, on sustainable seafood. It's the inter, the, the fact that this meeting brings together people from so many different sectors of this seafood community, uh, from the environmental movements, from the academics, from industry, from the donors. I want to highlight, this is the only time that this particular group of people gets together in the year. It's the only time we're all together. It's the only time when any of us are meeting with industry, where the industry people are here just to talk about sustainability. So let me start with the very obvious success. 
And this is something that's happened a lot faster, I think, than anyone thought it would. Um, in, we've looked at the numbers. Virtually every single major retailer in the United States and, North, and Canada now has a sustainability commitment of one type or another. All of the major international suppliers, branded, particularly the branded suppliers, are engaging. Uh, obviously, we heard from Henry and uh, as a very good example of that. Major restaurant chains are engaging as well. And we believe that over three quarters of the UK and US markets and in these sectors, particularly retail, uh, is now engaged. One of the impacts we've seen, and for many on the NGO community, this is still the main purpose or the main success, is to get major buyers out of bad fisheries. Shifting sources, we've seen a huge number of retailers and others start, stop sourcing what they can, are being told are very problematic species including orange ruffy, sharks, Chilean sea bass, and Canadian cod. McDonald's went even further and said, we are going to withdraw from this particular cod stock, but when it gets to a certain level of environmental performance, we will resume sourcing. So they set a very clear target. They said what their conditions were, and they explained those to their supply chain and basically worked with their supply chain to, to identify ways to make progress. Industry has to lead. I've made that point before. I'll make it again. Uh, it's the industry that knows what's going on in these situations. It's the industry that can take this to scale. Uh, the retailers and the major customers at the end need to send the right signal. And what improvements do they need to see in order to continue sourcing? If the fishery is that bad that they've pulled out, when will they re-enter? The second point I want to make is, and it's a general theme that's going to come up, despite the huge amount of fish that's imported into North America and Europe, we're not the only markets out there. Not the only people buying fish. If these markets stop buying fish, they go somewhere else. Even if everybody in this market stopped buying orange ruffy, it would go somewhere else. So orange ruffy has been one of the most successful stop buying campaigns, certainly at this point in time, with the retail sector. So one has to ask, why is it that the, the orange ruffy prices are currently amongst the highest levels we've seen? It doesn't make sense. Clearly, there's demand somewhere still in the system. And we've got to ask, are we ever going to get to the point where we can send a strong enough market signal through prices, or is this actually about sending a signal politically through the media? And if that's the case, what's wrong with sending that message through the supply chain? We're beginning to see that the supply chain is trying to do something. And that's right there, stage three as we call it. Companies are visibly active. And if they're successful, then we would expect to see some impact. Policies will change. Fishing practices will change. If the major yellowfin tuna buyers out of Sri Lanka all want to buy from circle hooks and set up a circle hook program, eventually most of those fish will be caught with circle hooks. We'll be able to document that. We'll be able to say, look, this has been an impact. But so we're get, I, when I see impact, I get pretty comfortable. So our improvement partnerships are really about trying to get an impact up as soon as possible. I want to see some policy impact. I want to see some practice change. Because then I can feel more confident, and hopefully so can the supply chain and the critics that we're working with, feel more confident that the fishery improvement project's actually getting somewhere. Overall demand for sustainability is weak in other key markets. There's a lot of overlap between North America and Europe about what we like to eat. And so it's great to have both markets on board, but ultimately if we want to reach an additional set of fisheries, we need to be in Spain, we need to be in Japan, Italy, and ultimately in places like Brazil, India, Russia, China. The main challenges for this community going forward are very shortly not going to be in North America or your Northern Europe. It's the developing world where we're now seeing an explosion of overfishing that needs to be brought under control. That's where the challenge is, in my view. There are still problems in the North, but increasingly the majority are in, are in the developing world. The other point I'll make is one I keep coming back to, I just want to finish it here. This is not, at the end of the day, a lot of this work is done because the catch sector benefits. If you can straighten out a fishery, if you can get it healthy, if you can get management rational, at the end of the day, it's in the interest of the catchers. Um, and that can work and proceed well in the complete absence of real solid market demand. All it needs is someone to start the ball rolling. So I'll just leave it there, I think. Thank you.